Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Fast Keto. I'm thrilled to have Vivica Meneghez joining us today. She is the founder of a website you've probably heard of and blog called The Nourished Cavemen. And she is joining us on the episode today to talk all about toxicity, stubborn fat, strategic carbs, and autoimmune conditions, where they come from, and how we can support our bodies in healing and detoxing. And uh, we also get into a really interesting discussion on the use of carbs in certain situations for hormones and for healing. And it's, it's a really interesting topic um, to explore. So I know you guys are going to enjoy this episode today with Vivica from The Nourished Caveman. All right. Good morning, Vivica. Welcome back to the Fast Keto Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you so much for having me, Vanessa. This is awesome and I really enjoy it. Thank you. I just love uh, the first time we got to record together. I was telling you that I thought you were a man for the longest time. Uh, which I know you get a lot because I followed your blog, The Nourished Caveman. And I definitely thought that, you know, you were a guy and I was like, oh, it's cool to see like a guy who's into this stuff. Like there's definitely more men in the space now, but I think it's been very female dominant for a while. So it was really cool to discover that uh, you're actually a cave woman. Yeah, that's like my lost in translation from Italian to English. <laughs> you would think that after 20 years or more in the States, a person can like master this language. <laughs> I don't know. For me, like, I don't know. I, I had the idea that cavemen was like generic enough to represent both sexes. Right. But, you that know, maybe sense. I should have said cave woman, but that never even like registered in my brain. <laughs> so yeah, the nurse. The nourished cave person doesn't really have the same ring to it. Right? <laughs> That's what it should be. But <clears throat> yeah. no, caveman is like, I can totally see why you would use that. It is a very generic term for like caveman days, caveman time, but um, it's a really great name. And I know you've been working in this space for a long time. So tell us a little bit about how you came to be in this space for anyone who hasn't heard of you, your blog before. Well, um, the blog started as a need because I was working yeah, as a nutritionist assistant, basically, in a chiropractic practice. And this was like, I think my first post was 2014. So it's been six years already, six and a half years. Time flies. Yeah. And the patients were constantly asking me, what are we going to eat? What should we eat? Where do we get recipes? And I got so tired of like, trying to compile recipes for them. I'm like, I'm just going to make my own recipes. Cause like from the very beginning, I've had a very specific style that comes, you know, from being Italian, from growing up 50 years ago in, you know, a restaurant and in a very, you know, traditional kind of way of eating. Like how many kids, you know, today they ate fried brains and liver on, you know, <laughs> weekly basis. And I liked it for me. It was like they asked me, what's your childhood food that you remember? I was like, fried brains, liver, pickled trout. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's just on everyone's list, right? Right. So I, it continued to translate through to my, you know, passion for healing foods and nutritious foods. And so at the time that the blog came about, there was also like this big diatribe between the paleo people and the Western Price people. As you might remember, it was like the thing of those years. And so, you know, I could not understand why, why those two factions would fight or argue about things because, yeah, it was like the whole dairy issues, dairy, yes, dairy, no, I understand. But for me, there was this like overlapping space where you could have natural, unprocessed, really healthy, traditional or ancestral foods. They were very nourishing but they could also be paleolithic so it was like this in between like focusing on nutrient dense foods with a paleo spin so unprocessed and it was just to say that it's unprocessed and it's nutrient dense and no we don't have to argue about it <laughs> i mean i kind of missed that um i kind of came just right to keto i kind of skipped over the paleo thing 
but I remember looking at the paleo world and there was a lot that I thought was great about it, you know, and I, especially removing gluten and, and grains, um, I didn't really quite understand the no dairy issue. And I also, I have personally had a big issue with all the like natural sweeteners that were being used in the paleo space, which is why I kind of like skipped over it, you know, um, cause I didn't, to me using dates and, and agave and, you know, honey and all this stuff, um, you know, you're just replacing one form of sugar of glucose for another. So I, I never resonated with that. And I think that's why I kind of skipped over it. Um, and the Weston price stuff I've really found through keto and it's, it's really been amazing. So that's, that's funny. I, I didn't know that there was like a, a disconnect there between them. Yeah. And I totally agree with you on the paleo. I think paleo started out really, you know, like <clears throat> the first people in paleo, like Mark Sissian and Cordan that wrote the book, um, it started out very differently. But what happened is there was like, that was the time of the blogging boom, where mm -hmm. all the bloggers were really, you know, like a thing. Um, which is not anymore it's kind of sadly because it was really a lovely community of people and though like what happened is that it started getting kind of taking a certain twist the whole paleo diet and what i found especially in my later days of blogging is that everybody in the paleo world was about sweets and treats and like they had entire blogs wonderful recipes wonderful stuff but like all desserts. I'm like, how can a person live like that? Somebody needs to be eating real food in this country, no? <laughs> yeah, cavemen <laughs> weren't running around making like all kinds of baked treats and things. Right, almond flour cakes and muffins and pancakes and waffles. <laughs> yeah, no. Definitely not. So I, I know that I always say my blog never made it big because like I had too many liver recipes. <laughs> I get that. It's still the truth. I get it because I mean my thing that I post the most about is my liver pate and I post about it constantly because it's to me it's like a gateway organ meats like try this and then you know it's a way to kind of dip your toe in it and it's just so incredibly nourishing and nutritious um but I know that in the past you know, maybe year and a half since I really, it's always been in my meal plans for like four mm -hmm. years and my cookbook too. But I know that from me posting it all the time that it did turn off some people that were just like, you know, more interested in maybe those like mug cakes and, you know, lemon tarts and, and things that I used to post more about. Um, and that, that not that there's anything wrong with that, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's a different mindset and um, yeah, I, I think there can still be space for some, you know, treats and things, but um, it just depends on what your relationship with food is and so many other factors. So um, getting back to you though, and your, your, how you kind of got into the space, um, what's kind of been your main focus? So that kind of has evolved. Uh, very spontaneously evolved as like I was kind of working my way through my health journey and my own personal healing journey. When I first started, like, you know, I didn't have a focus. I was just doing nutrition, just like, you know, so much information, so much to learn about the body. But then I discovered I was pre-diabetic. So that became my focus. I was like, uh oh, I need to like, you know, reverse my insulin resistance. I need to like get my blood sugars down. Um, that was like really my, my struggle. And so I focused a lot and I found a lot of people, so many people who are pre-diabetic, diabetic. That's when I discovered the ketogenic diet. And it was kind of like a miracle, you know, it came to me in this like really weird kind of, it's not like I was like, Oh, ketogenic diet. I'm going to do that. I didn't even know it existed because nobody knew it existed. Six years ago, who knew the ketogenic diet existed? You know, right. It was like a handful of people that were like, you know, diehards like Maria Emmerich or I forget the guy that wrote that big book. <laughs> but <clears throat> 
it came about like through an email from the practice I was working for. And so I started doing it and I started researching it. And immediately I was like, ping, big light bulb. I was like, well, you know, if this is related to insulin pathways, of course, reducing sugar and carbs is the way to heal it. Right. You know, why would we do it any other way? And why doesn't everybody do this? Like, <laughs> I was really puzzled that, you know, not whole of America would be doing keto, which now is happening and it's great. But so I started with the focus on, on like reversing insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. So I worked for a couple of years through that as then, you know, my perimenopause hit and I discovered that I had fibroids. Because, you know, I don't, I'm really healthy now, but I don't necessarily come from healthy habits in my past, like probably a lot of us, you know, that we didn't know better. A lot of people Mm. that we don't know better, you know, and luckily I always ate good being Italian, but, you know, I also drank a lot and partied a lot and had pizza sometimes. So fibroids you know, really severe fibroids came about and then all the symptoms of perimenopause, the hemorrhaging and, you know, really bad periods. And then my thyroid went down. So I started like smacked into another wall. I thought I was doing great again. And there it is. So of course I had to like try to resolve the issues myself. Myself, I don't really trust doctors and which is could be good or bad but you know I don't say everybody needs to be as extreme as I am I have a slight phobia of doctors especially in this country (laughs) so I decided of course to you know go the the natural way the nutrition way I had an incredible mentor Dr. Rhonda Nelson she used to be in practice now she just became a teacher to practitioners but she really took me under her wing and so as we resolved or and Hashimoto's that too that I was uncovered in the process and I was like okay I have giant fibros and autoimmune thyroid great <laughs> <laughs> so you know I had to take it in my hands and I did and within like two years my Hashimoto's was reversed and it wasn't super high but it was definitely there um, so I was able to reverse the Hashimoto's and my numbers were like really low up like maybe six or seven, still have antibodies. It's probably going to always happen, but, you know, nothing that I'm worried about. And then the fibroids, believe it or not, shrunk away to, you know, very reasonable size. I never had to have them operated on to become a hormone specialist. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really glad that you were able to find those you know, actually work for you and then, you know, be able to help and, and coach other people and guide other people who have those same, you know, issues. Now, one of the issues that a lot of women struggle with and men too is stubborn body fat. And I know that in your opinion, a lot of that is related to toxicity. So why is that? Well, if you know in physiology that when there are toxins floating around in the body, so the body will try to either flush them out naturally or if not able to do so, store them away. So because of, you know, your liver is kind of the big hub of detoxing. And <clears throat> how does the detoxing happen? The liver has these two phases where toxins are taken from a fat soluble form and like conjugated, at like added to protein. There are like all these different ways. I'm not going to go into the complicated stuff, but you know, there are different ways that your body will make those proteins um, water soluble versus fat soluble. So they can be excreted mainly through the urine and the feces. So it's kidney pathway and then intestinal pathway. Um, And so it's a lot of work for the liver, you know, and it has to have enough good proteins to bind them to. It has to have enough raw materials like sulfur for sulfurization or, you know, other compounds for, you know, the different enzymatic and mineral processes that it needs to do to get those toxins out. So when those things are missing, then the liver is like, oh, it's either we have too much toxins to deal with or not enough raw materials to get them out. So there is like a bottleneck at the liver. So your body is like, oh, 
red alert here, too many toxins are bottlenecking. So we need to put them somewhere, somewhere safe so they don't like start making the tissue sick, you know. Just same thing like with the autoimmune process. It will, you know, toxins will start to make an, a gland or an organ sick. So the body needs to store them somewhere. And the safest place is in your fat cells where there is this nice little bubble of fat surrounding this like dangerous toxic material. And the fat is like acts as an insulator. So the body really goes to the great extent to like, finding places to hide the toxins. In other ways, a lot of times when somebody is really toxic, there will be cysts or benign tumors. You know, sometimes not so benign tumors, but those are, you know, also ways where your body packs this, you know, radioactive toxic material, like, you know, like they put toxic nuclear waste inside the mountain, right. you know, or under the ground in barrels. So does the body. And when you have a lot of toxicity and, you know, usually what happens is that your weight loss disconnects from the calorie in, calorie out energy pathways. So, you know, for a person who's relatively healthy, like me, if I stop eating for three days, I lose five pounds, literally. My weight drops. And I know that, like, you know, I am healthy. A healthy person is able to do that. But when that doesn't happen and like you don't eat for a week and you lose one pound, you know your body is like screeching, halt, halt, stop everything. No, we can't do that. So it's just like holding on to that fat padding in order for, to keep you safe. So the way that I see that we enable people to lose weight again is just by opening those drainage pathways. Remember like the bathtub with the plug you know, and the, the hairball inside the drain. So we need to open up drainage, enable, provide the liver with all the little compounds that it needs to conjugate those toxins and also support, really support all the pathways of elimination. Um, the lymph, the kidney, you know, all the urinary pathways and the, the intestinal process of elimination so that everything flows, everything works then the body naturally will do the job. We don't even need to push it, but it's, it takes time because like, <clears throat> you know, there might be a lot in there. And there are studies that show that we can have heavy metals, like even in our bones and in the fatty tissues of our brain for 40, 50 years. It's just stuck there, you know, and we need to be able, <clears throat> excuse me, to let it out. So what are some of the things that you recommend to people that they can do to support that detoxification and enable the body to conjugate those toxins to be able to excrete them? So two things. First of all, stop the dirty water from coming in. So close that faucet. Stop eating and consuming and using toxic stuff. You know, anything that has glyphosate on it, it's got to go. GMO, it's got to go. You know, the toxic house cleaning products and like the free breeze and the dryer sheets and, you know, the creams that have 27,000 ingredients that you can't pronounce and they're, you know, all chemical. All this stuff got to go. Simplify, detoxify your life, number one. Um, number two is like, support your body with as much nutrition as possible so you know even if you're not doing a full detox like you know like with a practitioner at least by eating really nutritious foods your body will start doing the process by itself so mineral rich you know like bone broth and um eating like organ meats of course <laughs> of course you know and like um Clean water is so important. We never talk about that enough. Like <clears throat> the quality of your water, never drink tap water. And if you do, it has to be filtered in a really good way, like reverse osmosis filter. <clears throat> Sorry, it's pollen season here. So, <laughs> <clears throat> like, my voice is going down. Um, 
and then add in minerals back into the water that you reverse osmosis filter because it has, now it's like kind of dead blank slate water. So all the trace minerals, make sure you're getting those. And sometimes even in form of supplementation, if you don't know where else to get them, you know, good salt is important. Taking iodine is really, really important. Um, iodine is a little tricky, but it's better to take it than not to take it. And there is like what the FDA says about iodine shutting down your thyroid is complete bogus based on really, really bad research. So don't be afraid of iodine. <laughs> I, I think there's iodine in kelp, right? Yes. And I just bought kelp. a bunch today of dehydrated kelp to make like a seaweed salad. Kelp is amazing and I absolutely love it. You just really need to be mindful of sourcing because, you know, kelp comes from the ocean and the ocean is also full of heavy metals now. So, you know, I would use kelp in moderation and just like um, a good form of iodine is elemental iodine, which is like pure um, I-minus atoms. It's not, it's usually in an alcohol base, but it doesn't have to go iodide, potassium iodide and iodine, like which is the Lugol solution, which is the way that our Simporter system utilizes iodine. It has to have both elements to bring it into the thyroid. But if you use elemental iodine, it can go straight into the cells, which is really good. And it will help you detox as well. Iodine detoxes you from um, halogens like chlorine, that's everywhere because your body will soak up the chlorine when there is no iodine and you're present and your cells are iodine depleted. So they'll take up the chlorine instead because it's kind of similar. I'm like, oh, maybe we can use this, but it's actually making you sick instead. Wow, that's so interesting. Uh, yeah, the iodine, I've heard people talking about it more and more and it's kind of concerned me a bit because I, you know, with so many people using different kinds of salts, you know, that there, there's not that iodine, iodine in the salt anymore. So I'm like, is that going to create an iodine deficiency in all the low carbers? Because, you know, they're, they're using all these sea salts and things that don't have iodine added in them. And it's such an essential, you know, a mineral. Yeah, well, it was statistics say that about 90% of Americans are iodine deficient. Wow. And I, it's true. And like, this is like the first thing I give to my patients and to all my patients, every single one of them is iodine. It's a special kind of iodine. It's elemental iodine. It's like, you know, really pure, amazing product. But that's, if I had one supplement to choose from, from my whole practice and huge array of supplements, I would keep iodine. And um, I, I'll grab the link from you to put in the, in the show notes for people if they can, they can find they it. They actually, you know, unfortunately, this one is not an over-the-counter product. It's a professional-only product. Okay. So, yeah, it's not an Amazon thing. <laughs> would there be something? Because, I guess they could use seaweed or kelp or... Someone yeah, and they can, even Lugol's is better than nothing. Lugol's is a great beginning product. And, you know, um, I can probably find you a link for a good elemental iodine or a decent one they can get from Amazon. It's not going to be at the same strength, but it's also a good beginning product. And, um, yeah, yeah point them somewhere, right? <laughs> Now, one of the last things I really wanted to cover with you is the whole issue of strategic carbs. And uh, we, we've talked about this before because, you know, biochemically, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate and our bodies can make glucose on demand through the liver. And yet there seems to be this sort of segment of the population and women especially um, that have this, um, especially in the sort of menopausal range um, time period that sort of, I know you've worked with, that you've recommended like carnivore to zero carb, and then they've kind of hit a wall and then you've taken them back sort of this more 
modified carnivore approach. Um, so why do you think you see that so often? You know, honestly, Vanessa, I have never really found like a physiological biochemical reason. Like, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of the, the processes of the body and I can tell you like, oh, you need this because of this. There is an underlying reason that is very clear, straightforward. Like, you know, you need to eliminate sugar because it will spike your insulin. This is a pretty straightforward process. But through the years that I was studying the, like the thyroid, for example, and like, you know, I was trying to find a reason why do we add more carbs to help conversion when actually the physiological need for carbs is minimal. It's yeah. so tiny that your body can make it yourself. And even if you ate like, I don't know, one cherry or like one, you know, little tiny three blueberries or a bite of like sweet potatoes would be enough to provide enough carbs for like conversion, plenty, you know, of thyroid hormones. But in, in practical, you know, in clinical practice, what I saw was not what the research told me or the physiology told me. And it, it was kind of puzzling because like, I could never find a justification. Why do perimenopausal women need carbs strategically? Um, so for me, it's been a little bit of a mystery and maybe like you're the right person to do well, this kind of investigation, I right? One, I have one theory that um, was actually presented by Ella Bruce and I, I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, and so in this case, it specifically seems to be with women who have lower, who are in that sort of like age range, but have mm -hmm. a lower body fat percentage. And her theory was that there's a, there, the body is rate limited in terms of how much energy it can use from its own stored fat and that there's a connection between the liver glycogen mm -hmm. that needs to happen in order for the body to be able to sort of like say a person is at around 20 percent body fat that they can only get around 700 like 69 calories per pound of fat so something around seven to eight hundred calories they can get from stored energy but they can't make up the rest Mm -hmm. from that stored from the stored energy on the body so it has to come in another source and that's with you know dietary fat being higher but also that there's this connection with the carbs being eaten that enables the liver to keep glycogen stores full and that's kind of the connection that she said is connected back to women's hormones Hormone. It's a theory, obviously, but um, I found it really interesting. And there's something, it would make sense, you know, that the liver's glycogen stores being depleted would signal something to the body versus having them full, which you can do really easily with like some starchy carbs. And she even had it down to the exact gram amount, like a, an equation. And I have a friend who had who was in that stage who was having horrible PMS reactions, she's carnivore mm. every month. And she found that if she had 40 grams of starchy carbs in that period, the PMS week, that all her symptoms went away, no yeah. irritability, no mood issues. Um, like, and she, she thought it had something to do with leptin and carbs. And we know there's something hormonally being, expressed with yeah. external glucose versus your body making i don't know if we'll ever find i really it. like that yeah that makes sense but you know where i think that applies 100 percent. that feels like intuitively like it's a perfect match uh, young women who lose their periods when they go zero carbs i think oh, that gosh. that is like exactly the reason why because of like their body inability to break get enough energy from the fat itself and like so what it does it starts conserving energy so you stop your period mm. what i 
what I observed in perimenopausal women, though, it's like the case was a little different because a lot of these women do have fat stores and they are over 20% fat, but it, the fat is like in their bellies. So it's estrogen, okay. you know, like your estrogen starts getting lower and lower. So your body is trying to like, maybe it, it is related to that, but it works, expresses itself differently because like your body is maybe thinking, okay, I need to preserve estrogen production. So I'm going to increase the fat deposits. So that's going to help the adrenal create more estrogen because, you know, you know, the fat cells are also mini endocrine organs in a way to help produce estrogen. Yes. So it's interesting, like, you know, you get the little pouch when you're in perimenopause or menopause. Well, that's what your, your ovaries were. And now you have fat there that's producing estrogen. So it's possible that because of like the lack of your body is not making enough energy through the fat alone. So it's trying to preserve and it's also trying to create fat deposits to help increase estrogen production. So you get symptomatic because your body is trying to tell you like, I need more easy to convert energy that I can store as, you know, estrogen making material. Yeah, I would see kind of like that, right? Would that make sense to you? Absolutely. And, you know, we know also that estrogen, you need sterols, a cholesterol in order to make estrogen. And so it, it would make sense too that your body would be in that self-preservation mode and everything um, if it doesn't have enough of those like building blocks and, and whatnot. But yeah, it's... It's so interesting. I'm glad at least that you've been able to see with a lot of your clients that you've worked with that you've, that have tried carnivore and then it hasn't worked for them that then they will find this other solution, adding some carbs. And I've been predicting for a while that a lot of people would be coming back from carnivore to keto, keto carnivore, because not everyone really needs to be there. I mean, you can be meat based, you can be carnivore adjacent, uh, keto carnivore, you don't necessarily have to be in that like meat water space to thrive unless you have like really unresolved issues that you cannot solve or resolve without going there. But then people go there and they're like, well, I feel great. And like, I miss lettuce and salads or avocados or whatever. Um, and it can actually help them thrive more in, in those situations. It's really cool. And women are very different than men. Like, look at, like, a lot of people in the carnivore space, I think in the big guys, like Sean Baker, you know, and Saladino, and, like, you know, and a bunch of other doctors, like, they're mostly guys. Their hormones are very different than ours. And, like, and also think about there are a lot of women that do carnivore that are younger. They haven't hit that perimenopause craziness yet. Right, right. <laughs> So, you know, if you're doing it, um, it, yeah, there are a lot of interesting variables here, but I still think that carnivore is like absolutely valuable tool for healing. And I, you know, I love that the diet, the thinking, the movement is just like everything else. We don't have, we can make it a dogma, right? We can make it like the Rosetta Stone, written in stone, it's this or nothing, we need to be flexible because like yes. the body changes all the time. Yes. And I like, need to adapt to the body's needs as we heal, as we, you know, nourish, like just like connect that head to that body. Yes. Like we were exactly. saying before, right? If we look at autoimmunity, what in your opinion is sort of the root cause of mm. autoimmune disease? Well, I think that there are, two factors in autoimmunity. One is what is, you know, where is the body attacking itself? What organ or gland or system is going to, <clears throat> excuse me, and why? And the other one is like, why is your immune system so overactive? So there, is, there are two elements. One is like, why is that specific organ or gland coming under attack? And the other one is like, the dysfunction, like your immune system is not functioning at optimal. I don't think, you know, in conventional medicine is 
autoimmunity is considered a problem of the immune system. And, you know, doctors are looking at why is your immune system turning against you? So they fix, they try to fix or, you know, suppress the immune system. In nutrition and like, you know, from a holistic point of view, the immune system is actually just doing its job. And, you know, it's just, there might be an imbalance. But for me, the main root causes can be reduced to kind of few elements. But for example, heavy metals, that's a big one. It was for me, you know, I had really bad teeth and like a lot of um, amalgam cavities amalgam filled cavities that you know percolate down from your parotid gland down 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 straight into your thyroid this happens to a lot of people you know that through the years chewing chewing the, that mercury those chemicals that come from with the filling they start making your thyroid sick you know and so that's one thing i think that pesticides glyphosates is another big reason these days as especially attacking your gut and like the gut lining, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. So many people, you know, it's just boomed out. Why is this happening? Well, ask Monsanto maybe, <laughs> you know, and those are things that not a lot of people talk about. Another big thing can be mold, you know, like toxic mold, black mold, um, and then like mold causing like a susceptibility, English, um, to fungus and like carrying piggybacking fungal infections and opening the door for like those dysbiotic imbalances like candida and other things in your gut. But in, from the nutrition standpoint, going rewinding to explain it better, autoimmunity always starts with the weakness of a certain organ or gland which starts making, let's say your thyroid, you know, there is an inherent weakness of your thyroid. So the organ starts malfunctioning or, you know, having like a lack, lack of oxygen, um, you know, too many toxins. And so it starts becoming necrotic, you know, not saying it's going to rot in place, but a lot of the tissues, you know, the cells become necrotic. They shed into the bloodstream there is a high amount of that specific DNA from that cell, from that cell, from that organ that starts shedding into the bloodstream. So this is one part. And your immune system is trying to clean it up, clean it up, because DNA does not belong in your bloodstream where it can travel around and get attached to other cells and make crazy things happen in your body. You know, so there is that one process of cleanup. Then at the same time, there can be this like overactivity of your immune system, but mainly what happens is that your gut has become leaky and, you know, other proteins, so food proteins are now coming through the gut and they can be protein that mimic the proteins of your body. So this is what we call molecular mimicry, where, for example, the gluten proteins mimic the ones of the thyroid, the amino acid chains are very similar. So if you're eating bread and you have a leaky gut and that protein ends up in your bloodstream, your body will start like creating antibodies against that antigen, that, you know, foreign protein. And that being so similar to the one of your thyroid, usually what your body does is kind of become a bit indiscriminate and a bit agitated about these invaders. So it starts attacking kind of everybody and everything that looks even closely the same. So that's why so many people have leaky gut and then get autoimmune thyroid. But the same works for other organs. And like I was talking to a patient yesterday who has cirrhosis of the liver. And, you know, it's been going on for years. And it's like she also has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Nobody talks about autoimmunity of the liver. You know, you don't hear that every day. They don't talk about autoimmunity of your brain. People who might have had a concussion and then 10 years later, they're starting to experience all these neurological symptoms or brain fog, you know, um, car accident and then like cognitive issues. So any organ that's been damaged and then it's combined with this like bad intestinal scenario, dysbiosis and leaky gut, then it can very well turn into autoimmunity. And then why does autoimmune diseases piggyback on each other is because once your immune system is like kind of 
freaking out, you know, about this inner scenario of like all oh, these strange proteins floating everywhere. Your immune system is just like, ah, you know, and it's like, you know, it's like a very scared cop in the dark that starts shooting at everything. And, and then become, you know, more autoimmunity, more autoimmunity, more autoimmunity. But in my opinion, it's, you know, definitely just one of the stages of disease. It's not even its own thing in a way. And so we should consider it as a stage of disease because if we look at that, look at my thyroid and Hashimoto's, like so many people are like, oh, Hashimoto's is a life sentence. That's not, absolutely, absolutely not. And I've had several patients who did the same thing, reverse Hashimoto's, not, you know, it's a process, but it's not impossible. And all we have to do is treat it you know, as a phase of disease, so that as we heal the underlying conditions, your thyroid will stop being autoimmune. You know, that process will end. I'm not hearing you anymore. Oh. Okay. Possible that my. Hello? Hold on a second. I think something happened. Speaker. Let's try now. Hello? No. You can hear me? Mm, everything seems to be. Did it mute on your side by chance? Oh, there it is. You're coming yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Now okay. you're back. Good. All right. So I'll take it from my reply. Okay. There. I really love yeah. how you explained it from both sides of it. I think in our space, we hear a lot about how autoimmunity is connected to leaky gut and how we can develop, you know, this sort of porous, um, gut situation where undigested food particles are seeping out into the bloodstream. And it's so interesting to think of how there is that molecular mimicry and that, you know, some of those proteins would look a lot like say your thyroid and the body would mark them for destruction. And then you put the body in this auto immune state where you're, you know, you end up targeting both those proteins, which shouldn't be in your bloodstream and, you know, other organs, I think that, and also tying in the other side of it, which is, you know, disease connection is really, really interesting. Now, what are some of the first steps that you recommend to people if they're dealing with autoimmunity or they suspect they might be dealing with autoimmunity? What are some of the first things that you recommend people do? Well, I think that the first step necessarily needs to be healing your gut and um, well, getting your diet under control, of course, and looking at the root causes of why did your gut become permeable and leaky in the first place. Like I said, I think that this gigantic amount of chemicals that has been released in the environment in the last less than 50 years in the United States has had a big impact on how everybody's intestinal health is doing these days. So mostly like I blame it a lot on glyphosate. So like look at, but it could be heavy metals, you know, or it could be mold or it could be a virus that entered the body and like, you know, lodged itself there. Or it could be like, that the patient or the person has eaten dairy and bread, like bread and cheese, their whole life, and then they added kombucha on top of it, and everything went boom. <laughs> <laughs> this crazy overgrowth of like one strain of bacteria or a yeast that maybe is already present and it's okay, but then it just goes crazy in, in one direction, you know, kind of like a monoculture of the gut. Um, so we need to really cultivate our gut flora, heal the intestinal walls, and remove the offending root cause, whatever it might be. So 
you know, it's, sometimes it's difficult because a lot of people are like, how do I do this by myself? Um, it's not so easy. Like you can definitely do steps on your own, like in educating yourself about your diet and, you know, about eating clean, about removing toxins from your environment, cleaning up the household, you know, taking out all the toxic chemicals from your household, you know, from your personal care, that, those are very important steps. But then when it comes to actually like maybe de detoxing the body from the chemicals or, you know, the metals, whatever it is, it might be something that needs to be done with a professional because it can be a little tricky sometimes, especially some people are really toxic. Um, I know that a lot of people who are severely overweight and they have absolute inability to lose weight a lot of times is a factor of toxicity. Your body is just not able to release the toxins. So in that case, you know, I think that working with a professional will be better because you could make yourself even sicker, you know, leaving, letting stuff out from one organ and maybe floating around if your drainage pathways are not working, your liver is congested, like you're not able to like release the toxins that you're taking out in the proper way, they're gonna start bouncing around causing even more problems. So we wanna make sure that all the steps are done in order in order to like get those chemicals, those toxins out of the body and then start healing and nourishing and restoring that function of that organ or gland. So what are some of the symptoms that you typically see in someone when you know, they're, they maybe are having some kind of autoimmune you know, reactions um, where you would say, well, maybe we should take a look at, you know, fixing your gut and, and, uh, and healing? Well, you know, one of the things that happens a lot that you see a lot is like generic inflammation in the body. And, you know, a lot of times, again, doctors treat inflammation, they don't look what's under the inflammation. If we're looking at blood work, you know, there are specific markers that talk about inflammation. Then, you know, you will also look at the different markers for different organs like liver or kidneys, see how those are doing. A lot of times, even with functional markers, when I find that the blood work does not give me all the information. And I think that, you know, our body really tries to maintain homeostasis in the blood because otherwise we drop dead, you know. So the blood is kind of the last place where you want to go see imbalances because once that goes out of balance, you know that you're in trouble already. And that's even with like functional markers are more predictive markers, you know, while conventional markers are mar markers of actual disease happening right now. A lot of times we're out, maybe we are within the conventional markers in the blood, but we are out of functional markers. That for me is a predictor of something that's brewing, you know, kind of like subclinical could be called. Um, that's one thing, like, you know, we can look at those markers, we can look at inflammation, but symptoms are also really valuable. And like, you know, when I work with clients, I have them journal and as they journal their foods, they journal their symptoms. And it's like, we go into really fine detail and like I teach them how to like reconnect their heads with their bodies. <laughs> Cause like, you, you know, especially as women, we are so good at ignoring symptoms. Mm. We are such like tough warrior ladies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We have a high pain threshold by nature from all the periods and the children, you know. So we tend to really normalize, like, what is dysfunction. Right. And so we need to first start and, like, getting back in touch with what the body helps and like feeling good, feeling healthy, what do you mean? So what are all these little symptoms? And, like, paying attention, listening to your body, I think, that it's very important because it, it's gonna, the body kind of screams for help. You know, it doesn't let you get away with things. It's just like we put earplugs on and we don't <laughs> listen, you know, but instead like taking off the earplugs and start listening to what your body is trying to tell you and looking at even the slightest little symptoms can be clues. And, you know, I equate this work to detective work. 
all the time. I, you know, the work of a nutritionist or a holistic practitioner is very much the work of a detective. So it's, it's kind of fun and it's kind of maddening sometimes because the mm. body is like crazy complex and beautiful and like incredible piece of machinery. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, so it's an investigation process that will lead you. But like when I see that an organ is really struggling, then I like with this client that has cirrhosis, you know, I can imagine that her liver is like way gone, out immune, but nobody is like really talking. And I don't even know, like I never went to medical school. I never really went deep into like all the physiological stuff, but is cirrhosis considered an autoimmune process? Maybe it should, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so that's an like interesting that. perspective. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like one of the main symptoms would be inflammation that people would be experiencing or, you know, stubborn weight that they're not able to get off, mood issues, sort of like feeling emotional fatigue low energy kind of those things are probably what you see a lot of the time i'm curious um do you see any connection with histamine much and can that be a contributor with autoimmunity you know i gotta say that histamine I'm not a histamine like specialist but histamine pops up in my practice here and there and like you know, when I took my nutrition courses, it was never a thing, but I'm seeing it come up more and more. So it's become more on the general radar for people, which is something interesting, right? It's like, why like 10 years ago, nobody really talked about histamine and now like all these people are having histamine issues. I, you know, what I have found personally is that Histamine is like related to your liver's ability to process histamines out yeah. and the needed enzymes that need, you know, that are required to process histamine out. So I lead it back to like issues with the liver. Now we can look at it from like now with all the DNA tests that tell you like your liver, you're missing this gene and that gene and, you know, it's just fanatic. You know, there is some validity to that. Like, I know I have a gene that I can't process caffeine. So caffeine will always constantly bounce around in my body. It's genetic. I understand that. But I also think that I believe in epigenetics and, like, switching those genes around. So there is, like, this predisposition to histamine sensitivity. I think that's something or hypersensitivity, inability to process histamines. I think there is a component that is, you know, inherited or inherent in the body from the person. I also think a lot of that is environmental. And, you know, I developed a histamine sensitivity last, it was last year when I went to Italy. Okay. Um, or two years ago, and my whole face swelled up like crazy. And I had no idea what that was. You know, and it's funny, I was doing carnivore and in Italy, like there was, I don't eat pork. So there was a kind of a limited amount of stuff I could eat. So I ate a lot of dry meat and then I couldn't resist it. I usually don't do dairy, but I had an encounter with Gorgonzola. Oh it's yeah, forget about it. When I'm in Italy, trying to avoid dairy is pretty much impossible. Right, it's, and it's not even worth it. I'm like, let's leave it up for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, dry meat plus fermented like moldy cheese equals super high histamine. So I went over that threshold of my my body being able to process histamine, and my face like, you know, swelled up like a balloon. It was crazy. Did that continue? Like, did I develop an ongoing histamine sensitivity? No. I handled that. I right. cleared my liver. I did a detox when I came home, my liver detox. And then, you know, I also work with certain, a specific product that contains the histamine processing enzymes. So I made sure that I refed those specific enzymes to my body because maybe they were all used up and I wasn't getting enough. And then, you know, I made sure my liver could process things in general. 
and like opened up that drainage pathway, gave my liver lots of love and caring, and never came back. So, you know, there, I feel like there is a lot we can do with that as well. And just like, you know, as part of like the autoimmune process, it's, you know, looking at the root causes and trying to reverse those root causes as much as we can. I think that's what's so funny and tricky about these kinds of reactions, especially with histamine is, you know, you, when you realize that there's a certain amount that your body can tolerate and deal with. And then once you go over that threshold, that's when you see problems because people like my husband will be like, you know, I can eat dairy in Europe, but when we're in the U S like he can't. And then, but it seems like it's more of an accumulation. So he can like, go and go and go and it's the same for me like if i have dairy like i can go and go and go and then i hit a point and you just max out and i start getting like itchy and hives and like a lot of inflammation a lot of um like water retention uh and all this stuff starts happening and then you realize okay i gotta <laughs> i gotta slow my roll here and and cut back on it but it's very confusing for people because they're like well i'm just eating it fine and then all of a sudden this happened and it's understanding that there's like a tolerance or limit, you know, that your body, there's only so much that your body can, can handle. So what are some of the steps that people can take with all of this to like healing the gut, you know, providing the body with what it needs to be able to, to heal, you know, what are some like the healing protocols that you advocate for? Well, I think, you know, again, we start with diet and um, diet because why? Because like, of course, you're putting up stuff inside your body through the food, you know? So think about what are you actually inserting into this like machine of your food? It's like a car, like what kind of fuel does that car need? And, you know, the one to put gasoline in a diesel truck, so trying to align with your body's needs. And that's why, you know, I, like I told you, I was experimenting with carnivore. And I love carnivore. It's such a simple and, you know, satisfying way, lifestyle. I'm running a carnivore cookbook, by the way. So I'm going to join the club here soon. <laughs> but me, myself, I cannot do a strict carnivore diet. I need to do a modified carnivore, which is most you know, mostly what I have ended up with in my own life evolution is like modified carnivore yes. more than like what they call keto, kind of an ancestral nose to tail version of carnivore. But that is not for like necessarily for everyone. So I think that starting with like really cleaning up the diet, possibly an elimination diet, which carnivore is great for. Uh, for a period of time, especially for the gut healing, removing all plant matters for some time is very healing as an easy, really easy, good way to do elimination. And, you know, and then like start evolving the diet and the way of eating for your body's needs, um, really looking into like, what are the foods that nourish me? You know, what are the foods that bring life to this body? And what are the foods that actually are just for fun, but they slowly kill me? <laughs> right. So that's a great first step. Um, then, like, of course, detoxing and the ability to detox and really, like, jumpstarting and maintaining your body's ability to detox. Because I think that is crucial, absolutely crucial and pivotal for life and health. So do we want to age well and like be vital, have lots of energy, look good, you know, have clean skin and bright eyes, good hair, detox, you know? So <laughs> that's number two. And I would say begin detox process with a practitioner because there is a lot to learn around it. Once you've learned it, it's yours. And then you can do it on your own as many times as you need to. But to like start navigating when a person is really toxic, I think that, you know, getting some help with that is pretty vital. And then after detoxing, learning again, like how to nourish yourself, cleaning up your house, cleaning up your environment, 
you know, getting rid of like all this like stuff that could have caused your issues in the first place. Also very important because like, I always tell my patients, if you have a, a tub full of dirty water and you need to clean the tub, we well, want to end up with a tub full of clean water, right? So what do you do? Um, if you have two faucets, one is dirty water and one is clean water coming in, um, you need to like close the dirty water faucet. But also if your drain is clogged and the dirty water cannot go down and all the you know, nasty stuff floating in there cannot come out, well, you need to unclog the drain first right you know so take the hairball out of the drain you know <laughs> then stop the dirty water faucet let the clean water come through and then the dirty water will like slowly drain out and it will start filling with clean water and this is how we detox the body and what we do with the body so that kind of like a visual reference there if you think yeah about it. it's a great analogy i think it's really really helpful. So you personally, you've kind of gone through this sort of ancestral diet through paleo, Weston A. Price, and now you do a modified carnivore. So what does that look like for you? Um, so my modified carnivore is based on two reasons why I'm doing this. One is like my hormones and I've been mean, recently transitioned from perimenopause into menopause. So I have mean, found the need to add more carbs to my very strict keto that I did for years. Uh, so that was one thing. And the other one is like, as I experimented with carnivore, was like the needs of my belly. And because I never did a lot of glyphosates and I never did a lot of really bad things, my gut is actually... Um, pretty good you know I don't think I've ever had major leaky gut maybe for a time with Hashimoto's it wasn't good but of course all the healing that I've done I got to a place where my gut is pretty good so I felt like more benefit to from opening up my diet again and what it looks like is like I still eat nutrient dance and I still eat nose to tail and I still like I'm a big fan of sustainability. So I'm the one that will eat all the nasty bits, like not just the liver pate, you know, and like, you know, the, the tongue, the kidneys, the heart, the liver, the brain, if I could ever find some, but you know, here in the States is so hard. And I've been like relentlessly chasing after cow heads. <laughs> Hilarious. I guess sheep brains, I got those from a farmer friend, but the cow brains has been hard. And so I try to incorporate as many organs as I can. And, you know, also things like cod liver and like clean oysters as much as I can, like, you know, and clean seafoods. I eat scallops on a regular basis for selenium. Seafood is really tricky because of, you know, the pollution of the oceans, but I try to do it in moderation and like I support my drainage pathways big time. So I'm constantly supporting my livers and my, my liver and my kidneys um, with drainage supplements. I'm using especially like homeopathics at a certain level of like, you know, having detox for years and years, you can just maintain pretty easily. And homeopathics are great, like high level, you know, refined product that you can use for that. And then I use, you know, I, I love fermented stuff like fermented veggies, but again, histamines, so I can't overdo that one. It's yeah. that fine balance. It's like, keep your gut happy and don't overdose. Yes. <laughs> so I <clears throat> kind of make myself some kimchi. Kimchi is kind of my ferment of choice, but instead of cabbage, I use radish. Okay. You know, right to go easy on the cabbage being like, you know, um, goitrogen, oxalates, and even fermented cabbage is a lot better. So sauerkraut and kimchi from cabbage are better than just eating, you know, kale or cabbage, you know, especially raw, really bad idea. You know, fermented, it's okay. It breaks down a lot of the anti-nutrients. You know, the old people knew how to eat this plant matter. And, you know, uh, Paul Saladino talks about it in his book, which, you know, Western Price, of course, discovered like 100 years ago. 
is why are vegetable stuff so processed? Meaning we ferment them, we sprout them, we dry them, we do all this stuff to eat them. Well, because they need to be edible. And like our ancestors, our grandfathers knew that it's not really edible or you can't assimilate those nutrients unless somebody else is digesting them for you, meaning the bacteria. Yes, yes. Or animals that you then end up eating. Or the animals, yeah, that then you eat. So, and then I have a love affair with lettuce, but, you know, I love like beautiful heirloom lettuces. There are like so many different kinds and bitters like escarole, dandelion, and dive, radicchio. Those are like my favorite things. And they keep me pretty good. Like, you know, my belly likes them, like keeps me regular. And I just yeah. like enjoy my salads. I um, love salad. I miss like that's the one thing that I kind of miss is is crunchy lettuce and stuff. But the last three times that I tried reintroducing it, every time I found before that I had had a panic attack, and I used to have really bad anxiety. And I'm like, I just want to have some lettuce and salad, but yeah, um, it always gives me anxiety and like actual like pretty serious ones and I'm so used to now not having any anxiety that I'm like it's just not worth it's it. Not worth it. I love no. All those leaves. <laughs> I know. My boyfriend used to I had Crohn's disease. So if you give him a leaf of anything green, especially any lettuce of the even the best kind, you know, it goes straight through him. Like within literally ten minutes. And if it's cooked, like if I cook it to death, like I will even cook romaine sometimes yeah. and make it like cook mushy. It's not crunchy anymore, but then it's like tolerable a little bit. Yeah. But some people just, they can't do it. They can't do the fiber or they can't do the phytotoxins. Yeah. What's, what's interesting to me though, is hearing from people who've healed their guts and then being able, they've then been able to reintroduce foods they couldn't tolerate before you know, they're better able to handle dairy, they're better able to handle, you know, different um, plant foods and things. So I'm, I'm hopeful, though. And I, I think that's <clears throat> the healing work. And it's a really good indication that healings, you know, taken place. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And I think that, you know, as I feel like humans are definitely omnivores, in a way, or like a little bit of a scavenger, yes, too. Um, um, even though there, you know, people, some people in the carnivore world, they'll tend to try to prove that humans are just carnivores or evolved being mostly carnivores. But if you think about it and look at our evolutions, I think that humans being so smart, picked at everything and probed at everything that was like even remotely edible. So we did really evolve, like picking at a lot of different stuff and having like, a basic ability to navigate like most foods that doesn't mean that most foods are necessarily healthy even especially in large quantities for us meat i think is you know it's a good foundation it's like the yeah. strong solid foundation of your eating house and then the rest is really should just kind of be for you know fun or specific like i feel like plant matter is medicinal even though I know that some people don't agree and they say the hormones is, is not real. But in my clinical practice, on real people and through like ancient traditions, like, you know, Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, there are medicinal properties to plants. I just don't necessarily think of their food that we should eat in ton wise, you know, but we could still harness their medicinal properties, use them as food, with like specific intent and like a much better awareness of what dangers, you know, there are in those medicines that we are consuming, like the phytotoxins, you know, all the defenses that the plants create for themselves, you know, that they don't want to be eaten, but we also know how to disable some of them and turn things to our advantage. Like we say fermentation or, you know, feed them to a cow, of course. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I like having the cows do the fermentation for me. 
in their their stomachs. Um, well, tell us about your new cookbook that you're working on. Is it like strict carnivore or is it modified carnivore? Or what, what's your inspiration for it and what is it looking like? Um, so the inspiration, of course, for me personally is always healing, you know, and like, how do I provide some, you know, some good practical tools that is just like, just make the recipes and that will help you heal. And, you know, I, I'm doing this with a co-author this time because I didn't feel like doing all the work by myself. <laughs> and so it's really much more fun to work with somebody else and she's an incredible chef so I feel like it really added some like fanciness to the recipes <laughs> <laughs> from a professional chef my recipes are kind of plain but you know I again focus more on like nutrient density and healing properties and like I know that people don't have time to do elaborate stuff so my recipes are really simple to the point and with meat is great carnivore is like minimal ingredients so it's a challenge but you can get really creative with just two ingredients like water and salt but the book is actually divided in different styles of diet. And one is like super strict water and salt. And then, I mean, meat and salt, meat sorry. And meat. <laughs> meat, salt, and water. And then the, we open it up to like a more, like I call it ancestral um, way of eating that includes a little bit of berries and fruit and a little bit of honey. But again, in extreme moderation, kind of like as you know, especially as carbs, because they feel like there are people who really need those carbs. And you can still benefit from the carnivore diet as a base, but when you need strategic carbs, like, you know, a perimenopausal woman or somebody who has extreme adrenal fatigue, in the healing process, like medicinal carbs, let's call them, are useful. Right. So that part is also there. And it you know, it explains when and how to use it because for me, it's a really amazing tool for healing. And it can be fun and it's like, you know, it, it can definitely be sustainable. It can be sustainable for the planet. I've been preaching this for the last 10 years, you know, as I lived on a homestead and was really passionate about like sustainability, Joel Salatin and like Seth Holzer, all those old school guys that talked about ruminants and the benefits, you know, to the world, to the planet. So I'm like, oh, now finally people are catching on. And carnivore is a great way because like, you know, the people in the carnivore world have been really savvy about promoting this healthy way of like doing animals not factory farms i don't know any carnivores that promote factory farming and you know it's very like it, it makes my heart like explode like yes finally we're getting it we're, you know more people are talking about it and actually there are real tools and resources and we're supporting the small farmers and you know sustainability and you know really working towards a better outcome that crazy glyphosate monoculture <laughs> i agree it's a really really cool aspect of the carnivore and just meat-based community i mean if you look across everything from paleo western a price keto carnivore it's all meat-based you know that's the one thing we all agree on is like you've got to prioritize you know protein and, and meat and fats that naturally comes with it. And uh, that's one thing that we can all agree and we can all support, you know, the ranchers, like you were saying in regenerative agriculture, and it's better for the environment, it's better for the animals. It's, yeah, it's, it's really great to see. Now where can people find you online, follow your work, follow your book and, and all of that? So it's <clears throat> still the nourish caveman.com. That's still always there. I am going to branch out a little bit soon, but that's all still in the works. So the Nourish Caveman, um, you can find my website and then on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. I have, you know, pretty uh, solid YouTube channel throughout the years, lots of videos throughout the years. I stopped doing so much videos, but I have just so much stuff there already. So, and then if, Anybody wants to get in touch with me directly, they can just email me at vivica at 
thenourishcaveman.com. Awesome. Yeah. And you're most active. Are you most active on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook? Uh, probably Facebook and Instagram. I don't do Twitter and I, you know, I am kind of a little bit to the tangent span for social media, but yeah. I'm there, you know, so Instagram is like, yeah, um, more for fun for me, but Facebook is like, I have a page that the Nourish Cayman page has been there for like six years and there are, you know, connected to all the recipes and there are tons of live videos I've done on Facebook People can find like, you know, everything that I ever talked about on there pretty much. That's so great. Well, Vivica, thank you so much for joining us and being here and sharing uh, so much wisdom and knowledge with us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for all your incredible insight. It's really great to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Vanessa. This was an awesome conversation. Thank you again. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much for tuning into the episode today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed getting to record it. We could have chatted for hours and hours and uh, had to try to keep the episode relatively tight for you guys. So hope you guys got a lot out of it. If you had any takeaways, insights, light bulb moments, head over to Instagram and share them with us in a comment. We always love hearing from you guys. And I know Vivica would as well. Now, if you want to try out doing keto, keto carnivore, or carnivore with me as your coach and guide, you can head over to ketogenicgirl.com. If you've been doing this way of life for a while and you're just not getting the results that you would like to see, I know what that's all about and I would love to help guide and coach you to get those results. So you can head over to www.ketogenicgirl.com and check out the programs that I have there. They all come with my guidance, support, and coaching in our coaching group, and I would love to have you join. So until the next episode, have a fat-fueled rest of your day, and thanks for watching.